Hey, this video is a comment on Dr. Mike on diets where he did a diet review on ketogenic diets. It was a great video. I really enjoyed it. Very clear, very well organized. I just felt the perspective was a little bit limited and a lot of the comments indicated that people don't really understand this still. So I just wanted to broaden the perspective a little bit. Coming right up. Hey, I'm Dr. Eckberg with Wellness for Life, and if you'd like to truly master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss anything. So ketogenic diets is one of the hottest topics around. A lot of people have an opinion, but to this day, a lot of people still don't understand a whole lot about it, what it is or how it fits into human physiology or what's the historical perspective, is it a natural thing, etc. So we want to understand that the ketogenic diet, it's just part, it's, it's on a spectrum. If we look at carbohydrate consumption as going from extreme, as in the standard American diet, uh, down to low carbs, to ketogenic, and to intermittent fasting and fasting. This is really just extreme, ridiculous amounts of carbohydrate versus more normal versus restricted levels to reverse conditions. So standard American diet, people eat about three, 400 grams of carbs per day. A low carb would be about 60 to 80 grams. And if you cut that back enough so that the body doesn't have enough carbohydrates to always burn them first, then the body will learn to develop an alternate fuel. It will learn to access fat. And as it breaks down fat, some of those byproducts are called ketone bodies. And when we cut the carbs way, way back, the brain can use as much as 50 to 75% of its energy from ketone bodies. So a lot of people say that, oh, well, the brain has to have glucose. It runs only on glucose. That's not true. The brain is designed to run on glucose or ketone bodies, and it just depends on what phase of carbohydrate consumption we're in. Historically, this has been an important survival tool because if there is no food around for a week, then we go into starvation, we go into fasting, no carbohydrates, we need something else. So humans have done this for since we, as long as we've been around, basically. So Dr. Mike did a great review of, of what it is and, and so forth. But then I wanted to kind of elaborate just a little bit on a few points because his, he said that it was proven for weight loss and diabetes type two and epilepsy. And he said, that's great. So for those things, go ahead. And then he said that there wasn't really much evidence for it working with anything else. Well, that's kind of a medical perspective. That's looking at diseases as individual entities. But once we understand that insulin resistance is linked to every degenerative condition there is, there is virtually no disease. And I'm sure you can find one exception somewhere, but the vast majority, way, way over 90% of diseases uh, that we die from and suffer from and spend money on in our healthcare system, which is a disease and symptom management system, depend on insulin resistance. And this is just a scale. And based on physiology, we understand that if this is creating the problem, then reducing this is going to resolve a lot of the problems. And clinically, this is what we see. So we'll come back to the, to the research part. One more benefit and if you want to talk research, then of course, this is fairly new, but there was a Nobel Prize in 2016 awarded to a person who proved the mechanics of autophagy. And autophagy is a cleanup and recycling process that's been proven to be beneficial in all sorts of different conditions. So in addition to insulin resistance, if we combine the fact that we're reducing insulin resistance with the fact that we can produce some autophagy uh, down in the states of ketogenic diet and even more so in the intermittent fasting. Now we understand that even though the research isn't there yet, this may be the simple mo single most powerful tool 
and concept that we have to reverse all kinds of diseases. One of the drawbacks Dr. Mike mentioned was that the potential harm of giving up large food groups. So this is a little bit, a uh, little bit too narrow-minded. This means you don't really understand nutrition, especially historically. The only food group that you're giving up is grains and starchy carbohydrates. That's the only food group that you're giving up. And humans have not had that food long enough to become dependent on it. For most of human history, we haven't even had that food group. So that argument doesn't really have any bearing whatsoever. Uh, he did say, though, that some people develop side effects and they get what's called a, a, a keto flu. And we want to understand that there's more to this than just eating a ton of fat and, and cutting out carbohydrates because it still needs to be quality food. And the other reason that people develop side effects is that the more toxic and the more degenerated and the more sugar dependent you are, the more withdrawal symptoms. Sugar is a drug. So first, when you give up a drug, you will have a reaction. There's just no way about it. Uh, heroin has reactions of withdrawal and so does sugar. And the peop some people who have tried this can attest to how difficult it can be because sugar is a drug. And the other part is toxicity. Everything that the body gets used to becomes sort of a status quo. And any time that you change it, you will have a reaction. Anyone in clinical practice that works with changing diets and changing lifestyle is going to observe this. So that's, that's not news. It doesn't mean that there's something bad. It means that there's a healing crisis. There's something that you have to get through before the body is used to the new lifestyle. He said that he would not recommend it for the majority of patients because it was too hard. It was too restrictive. You would have to drastically change your food habits. And that's one point of view. But again, if we look at how well are we doing as a nation? We spend $3.2 trillion on healthcare. We have the sickest people on the planet and our diabetes and our obesity is through the roof. It's exponential. It's not even under any sort of control. So we have to ask, how well are we doing with what we're currently doing? And then we want to ask, if we want to change it, then maybe it's going to be a little bit hard. Maybe we have to wake up and understand that if you go through a grocery store and there is 20,000 shelf items, then all but 200 are modern. All but 200 are grain, and sugar and processed foods and chemicals and artificial flavors and artificial sweeteners and artificial colors and the list goes on and on and on. So sure, it's going to be a bit of a change, but are we worth it as a species or are we just going to say, oh, it's too hard? Um, possible side effects, we, we kind of talked about that. They're not really side effects, they're just transitions. And then he says that there's a lack of research. And I'm all in favor of research. I think we should research things. I think we should understand as much as we possibly can about, about every phenomena that we're studying. So research is great. But we can't wait for the research. We have to look at clinical results. And we look, have to look at what humans have done historically and we have to look at physiological principles. And then, if the research can fill in the gaps afterwards, that's great. But if they can't, it doesn't mean that we don't do the things that make sense. And what makes sense, again, if you go through a grocery store and you think that food is whatever is on the shelf, then maybe a ketogenic diet isn't going to make sense. Maybe it's going to seem too extreme. But if you understand that there's nothing in that grocery store that existed 10,000 years ago, then it's not so extreme.
the ketogenic diet is not the extreme part. The extreme part is what have we done to our lifestyle? What have we done to our food supply, our food chain, our environment in the last 50 to 100 years? That's the extreme part. And it's, it's unfortunate, but somewhere we have to kind of wake up and do something. The other thing about research is we have to ask who's going to pay for the research. So the vast majority of research is paid for. Most of the medical organizations, most of the government agencies, their major contributors are pharmaceutical companies and processed food industries. And neither of those entities have anything to gain from you eating natural food and getting healthy. There's about, and, and another part of the research thing is not only who pays for it, but how much is going to get published. So there is a rule I call the 90-10 rule that says basically 90% of research is going to be published if it's favorable to whoever paid for the study. And 10% is going to be published if it's not favorable. So there's a huge discrepancy in what research not only gets done, but what gets published. So we don't really know what's going on. And long term, what are the long term effects? Well, if we really honestly look back and if we study human populations that have been around for tens of thousands of years, we have plenty of cultures. Uh, there's been tribes in Africa who eat nothing but meat and, and blood and milk. Uh, we have, that's a very, very low carb. That's basically a ketogenic diet. Uh, we've had Eskimos, the Inuit, that have lived for as long as they have existed on basically a ketogenic diet year-round. They have no long-term health issues, they have no cardiovascular disease, they have no major health issues. So I just wanted to add my, my perspective on things. I have been on either a low-carb or a ketogenic diet for the last five years. Uh, I'm not overweight. I don't do it for those reasons. I do it because carbohydrates create disease. And today we have a population, depending on how you define insulin resistance, by the strict medical definition, we have maybe 50, 60% of the population being insulin resistant. But if you start looking at how many people are not at optimum levels of insulin and insulin sensitivity, if your A1C starts to creep up in the 5.4, 5.5 range, we have basically 80, 90% of the population here is insulin resistant. And that is what's driving all degenerative disease. Everything that they talk about with cardiovascular disease and stroke and diabetes, and metabolic syndrome and syndrome X and all these different things, they're all based on insulin resistance. And it's not a rare thing. It's almost all of us. So in that context, I wanted you to take, take another look at the ketogenic diet. Is it for everybody? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think that if you're not insulin resistant, or if you're just moderately insulin resistant, then I think you do fine on a low carb diet. Just reducing your carbohydrates until you get back to a species appropriate level, I think you'll do great. But I think for anyone who's insulin resistant, I think that would be the best thing that you can do for yourself. And if you have a more severe condition of some sort, like autoimmunity or leaky gut or diabetes, et cetera, et cetera, then I would suggest that you take a serious look at this and that you also include some intermittent fasting so that you can start taking benefit of this incredible mechanism called autophagy. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoy this sort of content, make sure that you subscribe and hit the notification. And again, this channel is for people to learn what health is. It's to save lives. It's to understand the bigger picture of what we're doing so that we can end or at least reduce this suffering. We can't change people, but we can inform them and let them make their own choices. So help us in that process. And until next time, thanks for watching.